In this video, we're going to have a look at a damped harmonic oscillator. That is, the differential equations that go along with it, its motion, its phase plane, equations that describe the motion, and how it is that we understand this. That's today on High Peak Education. What's going on, everybody? Hope you're having a wonderful day. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a mass and spring system that let's say is submerged in a fluid. So the fluid produces sort of a linear drag force. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the larger the velocity, the larger the drag force, the force is in Newtons. We're gonna use Newtons this video because we're gonna use SI units whenever we use units. But the idea is that I'm gonna show you what the resulting second order linear ordinary differential equation is and how to solve it using the quadratic equation and characteristic roots. I'm going to talk about over damping, under damping, and critical damping. Period. The modifying of the frequency, the phase plane, all kinds of stuff. Those questions are going to be answered for you today, right now. I, I don't know it off the top of my head. You have to get the characteristic equation, right? Yep. So first of all, we know F net equals MA which is mx double prime. By the way, we're using dots um, here because that's Newton's notation. So since we're doing a lot of physics today, we're just gonna sort of mostly stick with uh, Newton's notation. But then we also know F spring equals minus kx, and then F damping is equal to minus bv. And b is a positive constant and v is velocity. So that would be minus b x dot. Now, if you rearrange all that, you do get this equation, mx double dot, let's see, plus b v, or sorry, b x dot, because that's velocity, plus k x equal to f of t. Now, again, f of t right here, this could be a forcing function. Um, m is the mass. b is going to be the damping constant. Uh, let's see, K is the spring constant. I always forget what the units are uh, for the damping constant, but you can deduce it by the following. See how mass is going to be in kilograms in SI units? Spring constant will be Newton's per meter. That's how I learned it in physics one. But remember, Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So if you divide by meters, this is the same thing as kilograms per second squared. So what that, it stands to reason by analogy that B is going to be units of kilograms per second. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So just keep that in mind in case you ever need it. Notice whenever we do this sort of thing, this is the initial position. Yeah. And then this right here would be the initial velocity. So it turns out if you solve this characteristic equation, I would recommend you make two definitions. The first definition is defined omega zero. Do you know what omega zero is? Is that the period of the Not, frequency? So this is going to be the angular frequency. Okay. Remember, this is going to have units of radians per second. And remember, this is the so-called natural frequency of a simple harmonic motion oscillator, right? Okay. So if you have no damping, mm -hmm. the angular frequency is going to be the square root of k over m. And k is the yeah. spring constant, m is the mass, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you work that out, you just get units of radians per second. By the way, a lot of professors write that as 1 over seconds because radians are unitless. But I think it's a little more instructive to think about radians yeah. Yeah. because it sort of goes inside these trig functions. Yeah. Okay, that's the first thing. And then like you said, the period, we do need that equation. That's going to be 2 pi over omega. But notice I didn't write omega zero, I wrote omega. So we need a definition of omega. So omega is going to be the what? So it's going to be the damped frequency and this is going to be still in units of radians per second. Mm -hmm. But notice that omega is going to be the square root of omega not squared minus gamma squared. Okay. Now, so notice that there's sort of an adjusted frequency, if you will. 
okay? And it's adjusted or by this gamma, okay? Now, we obviously need to define what gamma is. Do you have any idea what gamma is usually defined as? Not everybody defines it like this, but I recommend you define it like this. Gamma is defined as B over 2M. So this is what we call the damping, now not the damping constant, but the damping factor. Okay, so the reason, the reason that we define it like this is because if we go back to this equation, and by the way, let's just for simplicity, let's just let f of t be zero, so there's no forcing function. Yeah, so let's do it this way. m x double dot plus 2 b over 2 x dot plus k x equals zero. Okay, so we're just letting the right-hand side be zero. And notice, I kind of wrote the middle term in a funny way. I did 2 times b over 2. But the thing is, if you do that, think about if you divide through by m. So if we divide this equation by m, okay, so this is a lot of times how we do differential equations because we want the coefficient on the first term to be 1. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about that before in, in other sessions. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be plus 2, and notice it's going to be b over 2m, so that's gamma, x dot, plus, now notice this is going to be k over m. But from our definition, k over m is going to be omega naught squared. Do you see that? So that's kind of convenient to write it like that. Now we only have two constants in this equation, and the quadratic equation is going to work out real nice. So it's going to be negative b, which is negative 2 gamma, plus or minus the square root of b squared is going to be 4 gamma squared, minus 4 times 1 times omega squared. Now notice, if I hadn't engineered in that additional 2 here, you would actually have fractions underneath the, the radical there, and it's not going to come out as cleanly, so to say. But it's over 2 times 1. So do you see that in the end, this is going to give you minus gamma plus and minus. Now, you're a pretty smart guy. Can you see that 4 is a greatest common factor here? Yeah. Do the square root, you get 2. 2 over 2 is just 1, so you're going to get the square root of gamma squared minus omega squared but here's the deal one more thing gamma squared minus omega squared is the default so to say from the quadratic formula by the way th this is solving this is solving by the way for r when the characteristic polynomial is r squared plus 2 gamma r plus omega naught squared equals 0 correct yeah. So this right here is the character. I kind of skipped that step, but you already mentioned that. So if that's a characteristic equation, this leads to these roots. But here's kind of an interesting thing. We assume this is a oscillating system. Do you expect there to be sort of sines and cosines for the most part? Yeah. Okay, so in other words, we typically want this discriminant remember the discriminant is sometimes called delta which is underneath the radical here of the uh, quadratic formula we typically want that to be negative so if we want that to be negative we essentially want an i which is the imaginary number to pop out so what we often do is the following so if we want this middle section to be negative what we typically do is we write this as minus gamma plus and minus the square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared times the imaginary number. But remember, the imaginary number means you're going to produce sines and cosines yeah. because as soon as you put that as e to the i something, you get sines and cosines. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to briefly say is then we redefine this. So do you see that if you've got a angular frequency squared minus something else that has to have the same units? squared um, and a square root that has to have units of radians per second. Yeah. So we just redefine this as omega. And omega is the square root of omega naught squared. Wow. Which, or sorry, well this is the roots which produces this general solution. So it's going to be some constant A e to the minus gamma t. Now notice that's the damping factor because it's the real part. But the imaginary part has to do with the oscillating part. Cosine omega t plus some b e to the minus gamma t sine omega t. Does that make sense? 
first of all, remember, we need to have this definition of angular, uh, natural frequency. We need to have this definition of period. We also need to have this definition of the damping factor. So those are all important definitions. Yeah. What's, uh, and, and then we need this definition of omega, right? Right here. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me box that a little better. Okay. So we need that definition of omega in order to just sort of go and move forth. A lot of times we write this as a single cosine function with a phase shift. Hopefully you've seen that in class, right? You could write this as x of t is equal to, now let's call it a naught. a naught is different than a. e to the minus gamma t times cosine of omega t plus phi. And phi is the phase shift. Because we know that a sine function that has the same frequency is going to be the same thing as a cosine function, except it's going to be shifted. Now, traditionally, sine is shifted uh, pi over 2 radians, correct? Yeah. But if the oscillator starts at its maximum value with zero um, velocity, then the graph would sort of look, this is, that was terrible, sorry, but the graph would roughly look like this. It would start at its maximum value, and then it would oscillate, or sorry, but the uh, amplitude's getting less with time. And that's because you kind of have this sort of, this right here is sort of the e to the minus gamma t factor. It's kind of, the, kind of the envelope of the amplitudes. But notice that here, the velocity is equal to zero because we're starting at maximally elongated. And then x equals x max. When we start the stopwatch and we track this oscillator, we don't always start the stopwatch perfectly when the thing is at rest at the, you know, maximal value. So we have to allow for a more general sort of version. Basically, if you do a right triangle, you can hopefully see that if A naught is the hypotenuse, A is the part here that deals with the X, because cosine usually goes with X when you're doing a right triangle. Would you agree with that? And then sine usually goes with y. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then we can say two things. We can say a naught is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared, where a and b are these constants from the sines and cosines solution. Phi would be this angle, the phase angle. And phi is going to be the inverse tangent of b over a. Do you see that? because it's B opposite over adjacent. So these are two other definitions we many times do need. So it says, put your calculus one skills to use to answer the following optimization problems. It says, for an underdamped mass and spring system, so they give you this information, find the maximum displacement for T greater than zero. You got, we have not gone over what overdamped, underdamped, or critically damped looks like. Okay, so we should briefly talk about that. So let's see, over damped, critically damped, and then under damped. So let's make a little table of what this kind of roughly indicates. So in general, in words, um, over damped means the following. So it means lots of uh, damping. Yeah. Okay. So under damped is little damping. So little damping, okay. And then critically damped is some damping, okay. And we'll define what that means in a moment. Okay, so over damped, this omega, think about this. Remember the definition of omega is typically we're assuming that omega naught is larger than gamma. So if you think about it, if we're under damped and you have little damping, then omega naught is greater than gamma. Do you see that? But if you're over damped, the damping factor, the gamma is larger than omega naught. Yeah. But then do you see that critically damped is when they're both just equal? Is that clear? Yeah. Now that all being said, another way to say this is what about the solutions fr from the characteristic 
uh, polynomial. Well, if you think about it, if you're under damped, we're going to have oscillating solutions. So R is going to be like negative gamma plus and minus omega. So you're going to basically have um, sines and cosines. Okay, that's what we would traditionally expect. If you're over damped, we're not going to really oscillate much. So R is going to be real. And then you're going to have decaying exponentials. Does that make sense? So the thing is, this thing's amplitude is going to crash into zero very quickly. Because if you submerge a mass, let's say in like honey or something, you know, it's not going to oscillate much, right? I mean, that's kind of the idea. And then critically damped, that'd be sort of like a medium fluid. So maybe think of, oh, I don't know, motor oil or something. Yeah. So it might go through one oscillation, whatever that really means. So R is going to be, and we've talked about this before, a double root, which remember, that means multiplicity of two, which means also the discriminant was actually equal to zero. So if you think about it, if omega naught equals gamma, then the square root in the quadratic formula just became zero. So that's that's an important insight. So if you think about that, if if delta is zero, an exponential and um, a t solution. Sorry, I kind of shoved it in there, but but you'll kind of get this. Okay. Now anyway, it turns out in order to test if we're over damped, critically damped, or under damped, all we really got to test is we really got to test this omega. Because we're essentially testing the discriminant, which is like what's underneath the radical of the quadratic formula. Okay? So that's essentially all we got to do. So let's write this down. Let's just say if it's under damped, then we expect, so we're finally doing part A now. <laughs> so we expect that omega naught is uh, greater than gamma. Let's actually calculate omega naught. So omega naught, remember, is the square root of k over m. So this could be the square root of three over one, which is the square root of three. And then gamma, remember, is b over two m. Two over two times one, which is just one. So it is uh, under damped because I think omega naught is indeed greater than gamma. And then what we want is we want to find the maximum displacement. What we need to do is we need to write out the solution, like the x of t in terms of the a's and b's. Mm -hmm. Then we need to use the initial conditions to find the a's and b's. Then we need to find the amplitude for like a single cosine function. They don't ask for the phase angle, but we could find the phase angle. And we're just going to fill in those values. Would you agree? So omega just becomes square root of 3. Right there. And then gamma just becomes 1. So I'm going to be a little bit lazy. I'm just going to delete those and just move those. And then now we need to use the initial conditions. So now let's plug in 0 for time, right? Because we know that when we plug in 0 for time, we have position is 1. By the way, you could assume that that's like 1 meter, right? So just let that be 1 meter. Okay, so we're going to have cosine of 0 and sine of 0. Now, don't forget good old unit circle stuff. Cosine of 0 is what special number? 1. And then sine of 0 is? Or 1. Yeah, 0. 0. Okay. So that's the idea. So basically, by the way, we're going to be doing that a lot today. So let's just try to do that part kind of fast. Yeah. Now, by the way, e to the 0 is always what special number? 1. Yeah, it's always 1. So basically x0 equaling 1 will equal, now think about it, it's, it's just going to be a. Do you see that? Because yeah. e to the 0, that's 1, that's 0, done. It is we then need the derivative, right? Because we need to take this equation and we need to take the dot of it. So we need to take the time derivative. Would you agree? Yeah. Now keep in mind, right? a is 1, so we might as well just make that a 1. When we do the product rule here, I think, I, I, well, we're going to need to use the product rule twice, right? Yeah. It's going to be, let me just write this down, prime of this equation, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and do the product rule twice. So the derivative of the first term is going to be minus e to the minus t 
cosine square root of 3t. Then we're going to do plus, leave the first term alone, but the derivative of cosine I think is negative sine. So I think it's going to be minus, and watch this, I think it's going to be square root of 3 is going to pop out. e to the minus t sine square root of 3t. Would you agree with that? Then it's going to be, we need the derivative of these other terms. Now that's going to be very similar. So it's going to be minus b e to the minus t sine square root of 3t. Uh, the derivative of sine is cosine, so it's going to be plus square root of 3 e to the negative t cosine of square root of 3t. Okay, so I should have done a dot, dot, dot there. This continues on to here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions on that? Nope. That's just the derivative. Okay, and then we need to plug in zero, okay? Yeah. So I hope you're okay with this. I'm just gonna save myself some writing. I'm gonna do x dot of zero. And then uh, let me just underline this in blue. That way you can see it. So I'm putting in zero there. I'm putting in zero there, zero here zero there, basically all the time slots, right? Okay, so let me ask you, all the sine terms, S-I-N-E, are what? It is zero. Yeah, that's gonna be zero there and zero there. Boom, yeah. done, right? All the cosine terms are gonna be what number? One. One, this is gonna be one and one. And then e to the zero we know is just one. So I think that we're gonna get, let's see, x dot of zero, is let's see we we were told that it was um zero right but that's also equal to let's see so that's going to be negative one do you see that from this first term it doesn't evaporate because it's e to the zero one cosine one so there we go and then this cosine term i think gives you plus square root of three yeah. and, oh and shoot you didn't squawk at me i need a b there gosh i apologize for that let me let me slip that in in black I, I really apologize for that because I was trying to be careful. Okay, so let me let me slip that in. Apologize for that, but at least I realized my error because we're solving for b, right? Okay, so then there we go. There we go. So it's negative uh, one plus square root of three b. So now we can solve that for b, right? So you move the one over. That's a the one over square root of three is going to equal to b. Would you agree with that? Okay. Now we're pretty much all set because now we can find a naught. Well, a naught, remember, is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So let's see. A was 1, so that's 1 plus. Now, if you square 1 over square root of 3, I think you'll just get 1 third. Yeah. And then square root of that. And I think that's 3 thirds plus 1 third. So this is the square root of 4 over the square root of 3, which is 2 over square root of 3 which you could just leave it like that, or you could also write it as um, two square root of three over three, either way. So that should be your answer, right? So this right here is the answer. Let's do part B here. It says for the critically damped mass system, so for, for one thing we expect um, omega naught to equal gamma, right? So remember the square root of K over M would be the square root of four over one, that's two. And then gamma is B over two M. And that's, let's see, four over two times one, which is also two. So indeed, that's the case. That's this, this is critically damped. But remember, let's recall what's going on. R one and two should be a double root. And the double root is going to be negative gamma plus and minus zero, which is really just negative gamma with a multiplicity of two. Remember we talked about that? The discriminant, that's the um, term underneath the square root of the quadratic formula is zero. So then we just go to that. So what does the solution look like? So it's gonna look like x of t is equal to a e to the minus gamma t plus, watch this, b t e to the minus gamma t. Does that look familiar? Because yeah. remember, these two 
functions are exponential decay, but they're linearly independent of each other because this one has a T. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but the thing is it doubles up on the gamma root. Now, by the way, of course, we know gamma is equal to 2. So this is just a e to the minus 2t plus b t e to the minus 2t. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we want to find the maximum displacement. Well, let's go ahead and go with x of 0. And I hope you're okay with me once again, saving myself a little bit of writing. I'm just going to put in 0 right there, 0 right there, and 0 right there. And remember, this whole thing equals, let's see, from up here, equals 0, right? Because the initial position is 0. Like, you can imagine the mass is moving through the equilibrium position, so to say, right? So I think that's just going to be, let's see, all those e to the zeros are 1s. And then this produces a 0, so we just get a equals 0, right? Then we need to take the dot of this equation, correct? The time derivative. So Newton would call it a dot. Leibniz would call it d by dt. Okay. Again, England and Germany have never had any conflicts. Uh, <laughs> so we need to use the product rule, at least on the second term. Would you agree? It's going to be x dot of t is, I think it's going to be minus gamma a e to the minus gamma t plus, now we got to be careful here. So we got to do the derivative of the first term, that's just the t, so it's just b e to the minus gamma t plus, now we've got to leave the t alone, but then we've got to do the derivative of the exponential. So it's going to be minus gamma, I should say, minus gamma b t e to the minus gamma t. Uh, let t equal to zero, and that has to do with this bad boy, right? So then this whole thing should equal two. And we're putting in zero in this term, this term here for t, this term, and then also right here for t. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, so let's work this out. I think two is going to equal to minus gamma a plus b. Would you agree with that? Yep. But remember, a we knew was zero, right? So the nice thing is this term is zero. So that means two equals b. So you know what, if I did the square root of a squared plus b squared, aren't I just going to get b in this case equal to a naught? So that's pretty easy in this case, right? Okay, remember the a term was 0, so I hope you're okay with this. I'm just going to knock this term out. And then b was 2, so I'm just going to replace that with a 2. And then gamma we knew to be 2, right? So we knew this to be two. And then let's see, I think I'm happy with that. because I think that's the full solution, right? Yep. And then not only is that the full solution in case they ask for it, a naught, which is the max displacement is gonna equal to two. And again, if you wanna put units on that, it's like meters, cause that's the SI unit, but you get the idea. Cause remember the formula, this goes back to what we did with that little sketch of the triangle. The This little sketch of the triangle is like, if you imagined a y-axis here and an x-axis here, you could imagine that if in the phase plane, so to say, the, ma the mass starts here at this point, this point here would be an x comma y. Well, let's put it this way. This x comma y would equal a comma b. Let's assume this triangle, by the way, is for t equal to zero, right? Yeah. So we ask the question, is there any magnitude in the cosine term or the sine term exclusively? Yeah. And then is there a phase shift for the sine and cosine? So basically that's where this triangle comes in. Yeah. So A has to do with X, B has to do with Y, because A has to do with cosine, B has to do with sine. And then yeah. a, what I'm calling a naught is just the hypotenuse, which is the maximum displacement of the mass from the origin. Yeah, makes sense. So that's essentially where that formula comes from. Okay, so that's why I did it here. Yeah. Okay, good, good old Pythagorean theorem. Now this one, even though it's a differential equation in terms of y, it's presented like a, but a damped harmonic oscillator. 
Because you see how you've got that extra two in there? Yeah. Yeah. So I can almost immediately tell that gamma is equal to square root of two, and then omega naught squared is equal to two. Do you see that? So gamma is equal to square root of two, but then omega naught is, because remember, what's what this should look like is y double prime plus two gamma y prime plus plus um, omega naught squared y equals zero, correct? Yeah. If you think about it like a, like a uh, damped harmonic oscillator in the vertical direction as opposed to the horizontal direction. Okay, so if that's the case, then let's first determine if it's underdamped, critically damped, or overdamped. Mm -hmm. That's usually a useful regime. That way you know what the solution looks like. So let's calculate omega, right? So omega, now remember, omega is based upon which one's greater than the other, uh, omega or, or, or gamma, right? So it's omega naught squared minus gamma squared, square rooted. Which one's greater? So let's calculate omega naught squared. Well, that's already there, it's two. But then gamma squared is gonna be two. So if you see that, this is gonna be critically damped again. Do you see that? because gamma was square root of two, so gamma squared is two, and then underneath there, the omega, the omega ends up being zero because it's really like gonna just go through one oscillation and then stop. Yeah. Because okay. the discriminant is zero, right? So it turns out, you know what? The solutions are gonna look exactly like they did in the last problem, except they're not gonna be in terms of y, they're gonna be in term, or sorry, not in terms of x, they're gonna be in terms of y. And then again, this should be y, y of t, there we go. And then let's see, we know gamma is equal to square root of two. So let's just pop that in. So this is both, this is square root of two, okay? You see how solving the quadratic equation once and coming up with a general recipe for these simple harmonic oscillators, it saves you a lot of time because you don't have to do like the characteristic equation every time, quadratic equation every time. It's, it's always going to come out very similar, right? Okay, so that's why we sort of do all that theory in the back. Okie doke, so if that's the case, it says give a basis for the solution space and write the solution space in terms of the basis. Well, this right here is the solution space in terms of the basis. But then what are the basis functions? So the basis, yes, e to the negative gamma t, but yes. And gamma is square root of two, right? So these are, if you want to think about this like a column vector, these are our basis functions, right? Since this is a second order differential equation, we need two basis functions to span the space, right? That's hence why it's a basis. But notice these are linearly independent, clearly, because this one has a T, this one does not. So that's how you also know it's a basis. It says change the second order non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation there into a system of first order ODEs. Okay, so this takes a little bit of finessing because the first time you do this, this kind of seems very weird. Like I remember when I first started learning this, I'm just like, what, why would you do this? Okay. So first of all, let's think about what the structure should look like. And by the way, this is the whole reason we kind of did matrix before. Mm -hmm. Given it's a system of first order ODEs, that means if it's second derivative, you're gonna need two equations each with a first derivative. Does that make sense? And by the way, it's two equations with two unknown variables. Now, by the way, the million dollar question is, what should we sort of introduce those as? So first of all, do you see that clearly X double dot, that's gotta go, that's gotta go. So think about this, X double dot, and why don't we just go ahead and call the variables that we're interested in U and V? So why don't we call this V dot? Okay, yep. because v dot would be the derivative of v, just one derivative, and that gives you x double dot. But the definition of v 
is going to be, let's say, v equals x dot. In other words, the first derivative. Because, well, if you do a derivative of v, then you get the second derivative, right? <laughs> I mean, it seems kind of weird, but you could sort of do this. It's like playing a game. Mm -hmm. But now, we also need to figure out what x is. So x, we're just going to say, let this be the case. But this has to be the case if x double dot is v dot. So think about this. We need something for x. So we're going to say, let now a different variable equal x. So let x equal, let's say, u. But then u dot is equal to, well, x dot. But that's also equal to v. Does that make sense? So that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this ODE and we're going to write it in sort of matrix form. I alluded to this a moment ago, okay? Because if it's a first order system, then we need to think about matrix. Yeah. Now, let's think about what the structure of this matrix should look like. Let's call it W. So W vector dot is equal to a, which is a coefficient matrix, times w vector. Now, what does this actually look like? w vector dot should be the dot of this column vector, the big dot of u, v, because u and v both have a dot associated with them. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, think about this. That's going to equal to then some coefficient matrix times u v are you okay with that okay so so far so good now we actually need to figure out what the coefficient matrix and shouldn't x double dot just become v dot would you agree so this is four v dot minus now think about this x dot we could make that u dot but that's the same thing as v so you want to make it as simple as possible so it's 2 v plus 3 now notice what x is we can't make that in terms of v so it has to be u 3 u equals 17 minus cosine t now the question is how can you get this is important we got to watch this carefully how would you get a v dot equation for here? So if we want this to be right there, we need to solve for v dot. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So we need to solve for v dot. So we need to move the u's and the v's to the right-hand side. Oh, and by the way, one more thing. I should have written this like so. This act matrix equation could have plus in general f uh, vector, where f vector here is um well so hang on let's let's actually call it uh let's call this h vector yeah h h vector but h vector is going to be um hang on I, I need to move this over okay so h vector is some column vector which in general could be a function of t or a function of g sorry about that because because there is a there is a right hand side in this case right okay so that's what i'm trying to say so there's a right hand side. So getting back to what we were doing, we want to solve for V dot and keep in mind the part that's matrix and the part that's F and G. Okay. So if we solve this for V dot, I think we're going to have four V dot equals, let me get this right. And let's start off with U. So I think it's going to be minus three U plus two V uh, plus this, right? The 17 minus cosine T. Let me just rewrite what we got. We've got 4v dot equals minus 3u plus 2v plus 17 minus cosine t. Now we need to divide this whole equation by 4. So v dot is minus 3 fourths u plus, now 2 over 4 is just a half, v plus 17 over 4 minus 1 over 4 cosine t. You agree with that? Now, this is the important. You got to watch this. This right here 
has to do with the matrix. You agree? Yep. This part right here is going to become part of the matrix. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me do it this way, like, like this, right? With the U and the V. Okay. But then this part, where is it here? Yes, this part right here is going to go with one of the functions, right? Now, by the way, since we're going to be getting the V dot equation, I actually think it's going to be this function, G, not F. So I hope you can see, first of all, when we start writing this stuff in, first of all, we have to have U and V here. But it should hopefully be clear to you that the GT is this 17 over 4 minus 1 over 4 cosine T. Yeah. Right? That's just the arbitrary function on the right-hand side. And put it in there. You okay with that? Okay, so just even though the font is terribly small, you know what it is, right? <laughs> okay, so that's that's what that is. Um, let me make this a little, I want to make this a little bigger because it's just the font is so small. Now, as far as the matrix part, do you see that the matrix part here is going to be minus three-fourths times U and one-half times V? So this is why we did matrix multiplication because watch this, this will be minus three fourths and then one half right there. Yeah. Do you see that? So that's what goes in this row of the matrix. Okay. okay, now guess what? Even though that was a lot of steps, yeah. the first equation is gonna be very easy because you know why? Because we solved the sort of the whole ODE for V dot, but notice that we just now need an equation for U dot. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, U dot, I think is just sitting right there. <laughs> you see that? U dot is just V. So U dot should be, now V it's one V. So we put one here, then we put a zero there because we got no U's in it. And the right hand side of this is zero. Uh, Make sense? Because U dot, because U dot is just V. Yeah. So it's just one in the matrix there, V, and then there's no equation on the right-hand side and no U is in it. So it says, change the second order homogeneous ordinary differential equation into a system of first order ODEs. So believe it or not, I think we've done it. Yeah. I mean, that was, that's, you know, kind of crazy sauce about how you get there, but hopefully it kind of makes sense to you. So let me go ahead and put a box around this. Okay, questions, comments, concerns. Does that make sense? And by the way, one more thing, some mathematicians get really mad when they see this. It's like, oh, why are you introducing U and V? Well, you don't have to. Well, okay, if you really want to be, you know, your math teacher's best friend, you could rewrite this whole thing. So here's what you could do. What you could do is the following. We know that U dot is V, but that's also X dot. And we also know that if V is X dot, then really what you could do is you could say, or you could make, whenever you see V here, you could just make it X dot. Yeah. Wherever you see U, U is X, right? You see that? U is just X. So you could make this X right here. And then you could do X and X dot. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm carrying around like an X dot and trying to keep track of how many dots I have, my brain gets unbelievably confused. <laughs> so I'd rather do it in terms of U and V. And then if the math professor's like, it has to be in terms of X, yeah. then change it back in terms of X okay. at the end. Okay. So just, just a quick note. Some professors are totally fine with you leaving this and you say where... So for this equation, you say where um, u equals x and then v equals x dot, right? Because yeah. that's sort of the two definitions that are sort of intrinsic to this system. Yeah. But some professors are just so mean that they're just like, has to be in terms of x, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so just making you aware that, you know, there are those mean people out there and they should, uh, they need to take a chill pill. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now, by the way, I'm already seeing the x, x dot phase plane. Yeah. So this is where 
changing from U and V to X, X dot kind of gets us to the notion of the face plane. Okay. okay. So that's kind of the idea. Now, by the way, I kind of mentioned this earlier briefly. In terms of this triangle, this triangle in some sense lives on the phase plane. Do you know why I know that? Well, here's one way to think about it. Um, let me just let me just make a couple brief sort of arguments here for you in terms of, um, yeah, down here. So let's just do a little, uh, little thought experiment before we get too far, okay? So this, uh, this general solution to a, a damped harmonic oscillator, this solution has a triangle that lives on the phase plane. So in our previous notation, you could call this U, which is X, and you could call this V, which remember is X dot. So the velocity is on the vertical axis, and then the position is on the horizontal axis. You okay with that so far? This right triangle here, you can imagine, has a point that's at a certain x, y point that's sort of sweeping through the phase plane. Yeah. Now the question is, what's the shape? Do you have any idea what the shape might be for a harmonic, uh, harmonic oscillator? A circle? Yeah, let's put it this way. So that's a special case. So it's going to be a circle if, let me get this right, if um, no omega, numbers. well, omega times A naught is equal to A naught. Okay. So think about this. Let's say the maximum displacement, so let me do an example. This will be a little more clear. If the maximum displacement is equal to 3 meters, then suppose omega equals one radian per second for the frequency, then omega times a would be three meters per second. Now, granted, when, this is kind of a loose equals here because it's not equal in terms of units, but as long as, let's just do magnitude here, I guess that can get around that. So as long as the magnitude of these two are the same, then it would be a circle. But otherwise, in general, could you imagine um, the, uh, and, and by the way, omega times a naught, this right here is the maximum speed. So this is the maximum speed, okay? Because we know the thing is gonna go to the right and to the left through equilibrium. So we're, when we're talking about magnitudes, we mostly care about speed. So if that's the maximum speed, omega times a, then that's going to be the maximum value up here on the vertical axis. So you see this is going to be positive omega a0. This is going to be a. Remember, a is from our um, a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. This is going to be b. Remember, this right here is going to be phi. Remember, that's the phase angle. Yep. And then do you notice that right there? This should actually now make some sense to you. That's a naught because that's just the max displacement oh, when you sweep when you sweep through the phase plane yeah okay so there you go now by the way what that means is this point right down here is minus omega a naught in terms of the velocity that's negative v max so it's yeah. the maximum speed but just going left as opposed to going right and i know you're on the edge of your seat but over here <laughs> this is going to be minus a naught okay so in general so in general for a, um, an oscillator, it's gonna be an ellipse, okay? It's gonna be an ellipse. Now, by the way, listen to me carefully. There's one other complication I should briefly say. It's gonna be an ellipse if the damping is equal to what special number? I'd say zero, because do you see that in this case right here, B is equal to zero. Okay. Do you see that? There's no damping. So if it's no damping, you're gonna get an ellipse. Now, by the way, in terms of um, do you cycle around counterclockwise or clockwise, that's determined by the initial conditions. Yep. So we'll get to that in a second. So counterclockwise versus clockwise um, is determined by the initial conditions. Okay? So we'll get to that. But anyway, 
Could you imagine if it was a damped harmonic oscillator? It would be an ellipse that spirals inward. Let your brain think about that a second. That makes sense, right? Because it just has less and less energy in the system with time. And that should be entirely reasonable. Because you've got, an, a, what is that? A decaying exponential with time. Correct? Because gamma is not zero. Because B is not zero. All that to say, now I think we're mostly set up for success. Now, we do need to figure out K and M and then phi and all that good stuff are. So now notice, it seems like they've already divided through by M. We don't know what M is. M could be one and then K would be 16, but then maybe they divided through by M. But either way, K over M is 16. Do you agree with that? So K over M in this case is equal to 16, okay? And remember, that's omega naught squared. That's the natural frequency squared. So then let's write down our friend, the general solution, right? I'm just going to write it again. And there's no damping, right? So since there's no damping, we can say gamma is equal to zero, right? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave off the exponential terms, okay? So it's just A cosine um, omega naught T plus B sine omega naught T. You good with that? Yep. Uh, let's plug in the initial conditions, right? So we need X of zero. Um, let's see. So if I put in zero, again, the sine term's gone, the cosine term's one. So A, and that's just equal to negative one. Okay. Yep. And then we need to do the derivative, right? So the derivative of this equation, I think just an omega naught pops out. Would you agree? Yep. And then cosine's derivative is negative sine, so it's minus omega naught A sine omega naught T plus, um, let's see, omega naught B cosine omega naught T. And then we just need to plug in zero. You know, one day artificial intelligence, when I'm working on an an electronic whiteboard, I'll be like, um, speaking to my microphone, I'll hit a button, you know, copy the last line, you know, <laughs> or something. <laughs> can't wait for that day. Because <laughs> that's clearly what I want to do, right? But yeah. I can't really tell the whiteboard that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, um, so sine of zero is zero. So that's gone, right? That's zero. Yeah. And then this right here is one. So, and then this whole thing equals, let's see, zero, right? It's at rest. So that means omega naught B is equal to zero. Now, by the way, we don't want omega naught to be zero. In fact, omega naught, I think is gonna be four. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Omega naught is four. So since omega naught is not zero, B has to be zero. So from that condition, B has to be zero. Now think about this. How do I know, not a pure, so a pure we have a, actually have a pure cosine function. Now, how do I know that? Why do I know it's a pure cosine function? Because if B equals zero, what that means is, let me go ahead and show you what I mean by that here. This right here means that this term is just zero in our case. You agree with that? So notice, does it make sense to you that phi should be zero radians? Because we're gonna start either maximally elongated or maximally compressed in terms of the X position. Yeah. Because since this sign is nothing, I mean, phi being inverse tan of B over A, but wait a minute, B is zero. I know what the inverse tan of zero is, right? It's just zero. Yeah. So what that means is this oscillator, even if it's an ellipse, it better start on the X axis. Okay. Not on the X dot axis, on the x-axis. You see what I'm saying? At, at least at time equals zero. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. So that's kind of a useful thing. Um, now, one more thing. Uh, we do need to figure out what a zero is. Well, if you think about it, that's actually pretty clear. So um, since a one, sorry, a is, so a zero in this case is just gonna be the square root of a squared plus b squared. But again, this right here equals zero. So it's just gonna be um, one. Okay, so that's the idea. So we can write our general solution of the um, x of t, 
or, or well, and I, I said general solution, but I meant that the the specific, the particular solution. So x of t is equal to, let's see, it's going to be one. I'm going to put the one there just to emphasize. Cosine of omega. Now, by the way, omega is omega naught in this case. So actually, let me do it this way. Let me do it as um, a zero cosine omega naught t plus phi, but then a zero is just one, so this is just one, and it's gonna be, and by the way, um, this is, let me make this a mega, but then we've got many special cases, but a zero equals one, omega equals omega naught, no damping, and then phi equals zero radians, we start at rest, on the x-axis, okay? Uh, x-axis of the face plane, of the face plane. You get with that? Okay, so there we go. X of t is one, so I'll just leave that off now because I already mentioned all that. Cosine of, and then omega naught I think was four. So this is four t. And there we go, okay? Now, one more thing, and this is kind of um, a little bit of an adjustment. Let's take a look back here at the initial position. The initial position was negative one. So we know the amplitude is one, but we also know it starts at negative one. So really in some sense, I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna kind of engineer in here like a minus because we know, because we know X of zero has to be negative one. Right? Yeah. So I just kind of threw in a minus there just so everything works out beautifully. Yeah. Okay? Now, the other thing I want to decide is let's now decide if we're going to go clock counterclockwise or clockwise. Mm -hmm. Well, without doing a grandiose sketch, I mean, it's going to be some sort of an ellipse. So hope you're good. I'm just going to do a quick and dirty ellipse sketch. Okay? And I think we basically start here. Would you agree? Because this is at x min. Yeah. And the question is, are we going to go... Let me do the different colors here. We're going to go counterclockwise, which would be this way. Or are we going to go clockwise, which is going to be this way, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's an important question. Well, we need to think about the fact that this is the x-axis, right? Positive x directions this way, negative x directions that way. The po Watch this, the positive x dot axis is that way, which is the velocity axis. Oh. Now think about this, this is kind of important. We know that the original, or sorry, yeah, we, well we know that the full function is negative cosine 4t. Do you agree with that? No. Negative cosine 4t. Now let's consider taking the derivative of that. So, if we take the derivative of this, I think it's going to be a sine, but it's going to be a positive sine. Would you agree? So, positive, then it's going to be 4 sine 4t. Four Would you agree? And then that is x dot, which is the velocity. Now, remember, velocity as a function of time tells us direction. Speed does not. Velocity does. Yep. So let's think about this. Suppose you plug in time equal to zero. Okay? So if you plug in time equal to zero, we know the original velocity is zero. Right? Yep. But now, let's instead plug in, like, you know, a value that um, is pretty small. Right? Like, let. in other words, what I want to know is I want to know... Um, yes, I know the velocity is zero at this point, but I want to know, is it going to be right here or is it going to be right there? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, does the velocity suddenly start to get bigger or smaller? Well, what we could do is we need the sine of, um, how would you say this? Like, so this slope here, if this is a positive slope, this would be a positive slope yeah. of... And let me get this right, dx dot dx, 
Yes, because that's the vertical axis variable over the horizontal axis variable, right? So what we need is we need dv dx, because x dot is v, would you agree? So we need the derivative of this equation with respect to x. So that's not always easily done. Um, so hang on, I really need to think about this in terms of which way it should go. So, okay, so let's put it this way. The logical way to do this without using calculus is let time go forward a little bit. So if you let time go forward to let's say pi over 16 seconds, which is not very long, then four times pi over 16 is pi over four. We know the cosine and the sine of pi over four are both square root of two over two. But you see that x is gonna be still a negative number, but then the velocity, so again, t is pi over 16 seconds, right? Sine is gonna be a positive number. So since this is gonna be a positive number, it's gonna be a positive velocity. I think the mass is moving to the right, and I think that it's gonna go clockwise. Because if you think about it, here, this is where uh, x dot is positive. Would you agree? So x dot is positive. Imagine, again, t is like pi over 16 seconds. Now, again, there should be a way to prove that. Um, I'm having a little bit of a brain fart about how you can actually prove that using calculus. Um, let's see. I mean, again, you could probably... Oh, by the way, one more thing. You know what might be useful, by the way? It might be useful to calculate the period because the period is the time it takes for one full revolution on the phase plane. Would you agree with that? So the period of this revolution is going to be 2 pi over omega naught. So that's 2 pi over 4. So that's going to be pi over 2. So think about it. This is time 0. When we get to this point, we've only gone pi over 8 seconds. Would you agree with that? But then we're going over here, we're at pi over four seconds. But then when we get down here, we're at, let me get this right, three pi over eight. And then we get back to where we started, we're at pi over two seconds. You see what I'm saying? So that's a useful thing. So, so by the way, part of the reason calculating the period was so useful is because I kind of arbitrarily chose pi over 16, but it kind of makes sense that pi over 16 would pertain to this point. So this point right here would be, let's say, t equals pi over 16. But that makes sense because that's halfway in time to pi over 8. And it's an easy value to plug in. So that actually worked out pretty well. So let's actually finally do a nice looking graph, shall we? We spent all this time, we sort of know about this system. Let's um, do a nice graph. Again, we could call this u, like we did before, or the x-axis, right? This is the positive direction here. So this right here is position. You can imagine this would be in meters. And this is negative x dot, so negative v. And this is positive v or positive x dot. So this is the velocity axis. We need to construct the ellipse. Now remember, kind of like we talked about before, the maximum value at the top should be omega times a zero. Yeah. So I think that, uh, let me write this down, v max, this is the maximum speed by the way, is omega naught times a zero. So that's gonna be four times one, right? Which is four meters per second, yeah. okay? Then a zero, of course, is just one meter. So what that means is we're gonna go here, whoops, we're gonna go here and here, and then we're gonna go one, two, three, four, up to there. One, two, three, four, okay. And we're gonna put in this ellipse. So let me see how well I can do this ellipse. Good enough for government work, I guess. <laughs> okay, and then let's start labeling the axis, right? So this is negative one, this is one, this is negative four, this is four. And then we know that, let's kind of, uh, I'm feeling crazy about my colors today. Let's use some colors we haven't used yet. This right here is gonna be t equals zero seconds, right? Then we know, let's use another crazy color. Let's use this one. 
this is going to be t equals pi over eight uh, yes pi over eight seconds we know that let's see let's choose a gray color we know that this right here is going to be t equals pi over four seconds and then we know that um let's see here let's choose this lime green this right here is going to be t equals three pi over eight seconds and then of course we get back here to the period is pi over two seconds right we're going to go this way that is we're going to go clockwise okay and we know that this right here is where it starts at maximal compression this right here is moving right at four meters per second through the equilibrium point okay that's what this point is maximally elongated correct moving left at negative four meters per second through equilibrium and i think i'm very happy with that yeah. okay so how's that feel all right great i think we understand this find the amplitude phase angle and period of the motion governed by this initial value problem okay so i think that k over m which is omega naught squared is equal to four right so omega naught is equal to two this is a simple harmonic motion oscillator right um, we know what the general solution looks like, and I'm just going to leave off the exponentials because there's no damping, right? That's a P. No damping. So that means B equals zero, so then gamma equals zero. So that's going to be, let's see, A cosine, it's omega naught in this case, 2T plus B sine 2T. Okay. All right, then you tell me, what's the next step? Yep, and that's one there. So again, it evaporates the sine term. The cosine term is just one, so that's just A equals one. You okay with that? I'm skipping steps, but we've done this a couple times today. Okay, and then we need X dots, right? Yep. So what's the X dot gonna be? Uh, well, the derivative, but no, we're not gonna put in zero yet. We're gonna do the derivative. So we gotta do so negative. Negative, negative, negative. Exactly. Cosine. Perfect. Exactly. Okay. Then we're going to put in zero. So we've done this a couple times today, right? We're putting in zero here, putting in zero there and zero there. The sine term is gone, right? Goodbye. So yeah, this term right here is zero. And then cosine of zero is what number? So then 2b equals uh, minus two, right? Whoops. That's minus two. So 2b is minus two then b equals negative one, right? Okay, now you tell me, how do we find the a naught that is the maximum amplitude? Or a squared plus b squared. Yep, so that's gonna be, let's see, uh, one squared plus negative one squared, yeah. and the square root, so what number do you get there? Uh, just one. I wouldn't say so, one plus one, Square root, of two, square root of two in this case, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got square root of two in this case. So that's one of the answers they're looking for. They want the phase angle. How do you get the phase angle? Inverse tan of B over A, right? So we need inverse tan of, let's see, B was negative one, and then A was one. So that's inverse tan of negative one. So give me an arc or give me an angle in radians whose tangent is negative one, right? So in degrees, I think that's negative 45 degrees. Would you agree? Yep. But that's going to be what in radians? Four. Negative pi over four. Because we're in quadrant four, so to say, right? Good old trig stuff, right? <laughs> okay. Now, finally, we need the period. So how are we going to get the period? I think I can probably sneak it in here. I hope you're okay with that. Yeah. Periods 2 pi over? T. I'd say omega. In this case, it's omega naught because there's no damping. Okay. So it's 2 pi over 2, right? Yep. 
So what's the period? Just pi. Yeah, pi. And again, if you want to put some units on that, that would be seconds. Yeah. The amplitude would be meters. And then even phi, if you wanted to, it's sort of like radians, right? Okay. So if you want units on those things. All right. So what we saw in this video is how we can break apart a damped harmonic oscillator into the different cases. That is over damped, critically damped, or under damped. Remember, under damped is the situation that actually sort of really looks like where the system does oscillate, but the magnitude of the oscillations get less with time. But hopefully you also notice in this video, we did several examples of simple harmonic motion. Now I have some other videos on this channel regarding simple harmonic motion. So please take a look at those. That's just where we have no damping force and that the force, that's the restoring force, the Hooke's law spring force is proportional to the displacement, but it's in the opposite direction. So hopefully one of the things you saw in this video is how the physics and the math come together. That is how we can perform differential equations to describe the mathematics that we know. And yeah, the physics and the mathematics very much go together. So hopefully you kind of have a much better understanding of how to analyze a damped harmonic oscillator and how you can describe it using lots of different mathematical tools, either systems of ordinary differential equations or using the characteristic equation, the auxiliary equation, and the characteristic polynomial, and getting the roots from the quadratic formula, and various things like that. That's kind of a real good way to analyze such systems. So stay tuned for more videos coming up on this channel, and thank you for watching High Peak Education. Please smash that like button if you enjoy this content. Please subscribe to the channel to grow the channel. Social media links are down in the description below. Please support us and thank you for your attention. We will see you in the next video.